Okay, uh, the District of Cheltenham will call this uh, council meeting to order on December the 10th uh, at 4.30. Uh, we will have order of the opening statement. As we begin our meeting this evening, we reflect on the service we provide to our citizens and we will endeavor to conduct our business effectively and productively on their behalf. Thank you. If there's anybody else standing out there, we've got a little bit of room along the side here. Okay, the meeting has been called to order, and the first uh, thing on is to adopt the agenda. There is one light, late item, and it's item CR3, that's the mayor's report, and we will be uh, altering our agenda for today. Uh, item number four, delegation presentation from MLA will go to just under new business, and then it would be public questions after that. And how the public questions will go, just for information, it will be directed to the chair, and then I will ask MLA Bernie that. So direct the questions to the chair, and then we will direct them to uh, MLA Bernie. Okay, first item up is uh, we need a mover for the adoption of the minutes. So moved. All those in favor, carry. Okay, uh, minutes of the regular council meeting he held on November 19, 2018. Okay. Carried. And then to uh, minutes of the committee of the whole meeting held on November 19, 2018. Minutes of the public hearing held on November 19, 2018. So moved. All those in favor? Carried. Bylaws, B1, District of Chetwin Zoning Amendment Bylaw number 1081, 2018, uh, required adoption. This is to do with cannabis. I move that adoption. Second. Rochelle, second. Okay. All those in favor? Carry. B2, the District of Chetwin Revenue Anticipation Bylaw number 1085 2018 requires first, second, and third reading. Motion to move for second and third reading. Second. Okay, Clay, second it. <laughs> Can we just get a brief explanation on this motion, just for clarification? Carol? Sure. This is a revenue anticipation bylaw. Um, our director of financial administration could explain it as well. Do you want to? Yeah, the, uh, the bylaw is designed to act as uh, essentially an overdraft to, to handle any cash flow issues. It, if we have a, a slow period where revenue isn't coming in as anticipated, this just gives us the ability to, to make sure we can still operate in the, in the interim. 
So just for a clarification for everybody in the, um, there's no anticipated borrowing? There's no anticipated borrowing. We haven't used, we've passed this bylaw every year since I've been here and we haven't used it in the last 10 anyways. So okay. it's just a protection factor just in case. Safety valve? Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Yeah. Gary. Committee reports. and council reports and mayor's report and administration reports. Should we move that we, they are in our, uh, can I make a motion that we're, uh, we want to adopt those as, as is? So moved. Okay, second. All those in favor? Gary. So items were discussion items, emails from Lord of Life College, uh, dated November 15th, you're invited. So I've indicated that I will not be attending. I've got another uh, engagement. I will be looking for an alternate. And email for the Peace River Regional District, November 21st, Peace River Regional Referral Temporary Use of Permit, file number 1828. Okay. Well, you still would make uh, a motion? Yeah, we'll, we'll make a motion for that uh, Okay, so I, I'll go ahead and make a motion that council author authorize an alternate to attend the Northern Lights College Board of Governors annual holiday luncheon in Dawson Creek on December 12th, 2018. Second. All those in favor? Gary. So, email from the Peace River Regional District dated November 21st, 2018, the PRRD referral for uh, PRRD temporary use permit, file number 18-288. I'll make the motion that council receive for information. Favor? Gary. Email from City of Dawson Creek dated November 29, 2018. Save the, <clears throat> save the date. May, mayoral update on the South Peace Health Service Society. Second. All those in favor? Gary. Correspondence uh, C1 to C5. We will make a motion that these all be included in this one motion, unless uh, council has uh, anything to pull out of there from C1 to C5. Not me. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. Favor? Carried? And also to do with information items. Is that it? <laughs> items I1 to I2. Make the motion that we. I'll make a motion that we receive them. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Carry. RA-1 2019 council meeting scheduled. I'll make that recommendation that the 2019 regular council meetings be held in the council chambers at 4.30 p.m. on the dates listed and that the 
2019 council meeting schedule be made available to the public by posting a copy at the municipal office. I'll second that. All those in favor? RA2 Business Facade Improvement Program Grant Administr Administration. Okay. I'll make that recommendation that Council approve the application to Northern Development Initiative Trust for application for the Facade Improvement Program for 2019. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Carried. And report for information, we have none, new business, done. And we will move now to MLA Bernier with the Caribou. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, um, there we go, I'll turn that thing on so everybody can hear me. Um, this is my first time addressing uh, council since the election, so let me start off first of all by saying congratulations to yourself and to the newly elected councillors and for those that uh, ran in, uh, incumbents that got back in, congratulations as well. Uh, it's great to see so many people here today. I think this has uh, caught me a little off guard when I first came in. I got the uh, message last week to, to come and, and uh, talk with council on the caribou issue. Uh, since then, of course, things have gotten a little I think expectedly uh, a little bit uh, heated in the region uh, for good reason. So let me just back up a little bit and give some information. I know, uh, Your Worship, you said you'd allow questions afterwards if, if people have any, and I'll do the best I can uh, That's through, correct. through you to, uh, to answer any questions. So the federal government, and I know some people in the room probably know this, but let me just uh, go back and give a little bit of uh, background and history on this. The federal government back in about 2005 recognized uh, through uh, regulations that they had that we had to start looking at some species at risk across Canada and caribou uh, was recognized uh, in BC and Alberta and other areas that as one of them. The provincial governments were tasked then to come up with policies or regulations to look at the um, uh, to look at ways to preserve the habitats that we have here in British Columbia. From about 2005 to about 2014, uh, things were taking place in the province uh, that would look at things like penning, um, some breeding programs, there was calling programs that were taking place, and it was a lot of that information was based on uh, working with biologists in the province that were bringing scientific information forward uh, so we could look at the caribou herds in the region. Now, if we look down in the southern part of British Columbia, uh, there's one caribou herd down in the south that is down to three. And that's three females, and I actually went to biology 12, so I don't know how successful they are going to be at uh, producing and, and growing. Uh, but in this region, we're actually still quite healthy. And in fact, the last couple of years, we've seen an increase in our caribou population in the area. But some of the th changes that were taking place in, in the past, as I mentioned some of them, and we worked closely with some of the industry partners in the backcountry, forestry, uh, mining, and oil and gas to look at uh, some of the impacts that they were having and how we could look at maybe mitigating factors around regulation. Uh, a most obvious one that people might know is, for instance, uh, you used to see our seismic cut lines that would go for miles and miles on end in straight lines, and so one of the regulation changes uh, to try to stop around predation uh, for, for our wolves that we have in the area was to have more of a zigzag approach so you didn't have that line of sight uh, for predators. So we were looking at doing some uh, different changes, working with uh, stakeholders and working with different uh, uh, companies in, in the province. Take it, to, take it to today in the last year. So. Uh, we have a change in government, a new government has a little bit of a different approach on this and they're still under the same mandate of coming up with uh, policies or programs to try to uh, help our caribou population uh, and species at risk. Uh, I have some concerns, uh, obviously, as I think some people in this room uh, and I know council in the regional district uh, has as well. And that is the fact that there's a lot of discussion that's going on 
and the stakeholders and people aren't at the table to actually understand what's taking place. So it's hard for me to, uh, to actually tell you what the government is thinking because I don't know. And that uh, troubles me as the local MLA. My office, uh, Your Worship, is around 20, 30 feet away from the Minister of Environment and the Minister of Forest Lands. I see them almost daily in the legislature, in the hallways. I've talked to them uh, on this issue, uh, trying to get formal meetings. Uh, I've had probably four or five formal meetings that were set up over the last few months in Victoria, and with a couple of days notice, every single one of them got canceled. So to date, I have not had uh, a meeting fulfilled uh, by the new government uh, on this issue. Uh, we have a, a rural caucus because um, this is not just affecting this area. Anything that happens here will affect all of rural BC and British Columbia as a whole, I would say. And so we have a rural caucus that has put this as the top issue. We have sent over a half a dozen meeting request letters to the government as well and to the Premier. And over the, we've had three of those scheduled, uh, the last one being three weeks ago, and they were all cancelled as well. So to this date, the Rural Caucus has not met uh, with government. That brings uh, obviously a lot of concern. I know some of the council councillors from uh, here, as well as the regional district. Uh, I set up meetings down in Victoria about a month ago. Uh, some of the mayors came down and were able to meet with uh, junior staff, I would say, with all due respect to them, within the ministries, but those aren't the decision makers. Uh, so they weren't able to give any information. They were able to gather some concerns and hopefully pass those on uh, to the minister. I was actually really excited for uh, last week when they finally admitted to coming to the area, uh, agreed to coming up and meeting with the individual mayor's councillors, uh, myself and some of the stakeholders. Um, and as we all know, those meetings got cancelled. Uh, I can't tell you why. My assumption is, is that we are starting to get um, more understanding of how important this issue is, the, the impacts that we will, that will have on the region if these uh, closures take place. So obviously what's happening is the government's basically gone to a map and circled a, a large swath of land saying this is caribou habitat and then we can all argue whether people have even seen ever in the history of man here, a, a caribou in that area, but that's still up for debate. But uh, the point is, uh, I know the uh, Snowmobile Association met last night, uh, numerous councils have meeting, uh, had met. Um, I've got numerous meetings this week with m most stakeholders that I can think of uh, on this issue, and the message is the same. They all have uh, a huge a desire to have the backcountry open for whatever their uh, club's uh, uses are. Every single group I've met, including uh, yourself, your worship, and council, has said, of course we have to do what we can to try to preserve and save uh, species at risk in the backcountry. Uh, but that has to be based on science, and it has to be based on consultation, it has to be based on discussions, so people can actually bring their issues forward. Uh, right now, when you look at the fact that nobody's been at the table, it's been hard for us to really, um, to really express to government uh, how important this is. I know for Chetwin specifically, I've met with uh, the mills that operate in this area and the mining companies uh, in Victoria quite recently. They have all said the same thing. They haven't been able to have a meaningful discussion with government and what their fear is, is if, if the backcountry usage of all people, including our industry, is not taken into consideration when uh, no-go zones are determined, that could have negative economic impacts, which now affects communities and the livelihoods and the families in the area. Uh, the same people that also have the recreational opportunities in the back. Uh, the companies, I don't think they're over-exaggerating when they say if they don't have the access to the, to the land base that they need for their industrial operations, they don't know how they can operate in the area. So I know uh, yourself and council, uh, I know you've been trying to get the message out there as well, uh, how important this is for your community, and I applaud you for that. 
I know the other communities, uh, along with the regional district, uh, are doing the same thing. Um, my hope is that we continue that. I know it's going into the Christmas season. Uh, a lot of the staff down in Victoria uh, might be away, but that shouldn't stop the, for lack of better words, pressure that we need to put on government. And the main issue, again, I think has to be that we are just at the table so we can express our concerns and bring forward our ideas <laughs> on what we can do to try to uh, coexist so we can make sure that our communities can grow, our businesses can operate so families can live here, but we can still use the backcountry. And sometimes I can be a little off color and get myself in trouble, but last week in the legislature, I went as far as saying, you know, if there was an endangered squirrel in Stanley Park, would they shut Stanley Park down to the public and nobody would be allowed to use it? Of course not, because people down there would go crazy. Well, I think up here we need to recognize that we live in rural British Columbia for a reason. The opportunities for our families, for jobs, but also equally the opportunities to be able to have the back country to explore, to enjoy. And being with the animals is part of that. So of course we want to see them healthy and, and, and uh, thriving out there. Uh, but my opinion, obviously, is that we need to be talking about it more holistically, uh, science-based approach of how we're going to solve this problem. So again, I'll uh, maybe turn it over to you, uh, Your Worship, uh, because the only other thing I could add is that we don't know much more until we're hearing maybe January or early February they might come back with more information. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike, and uh, we'll just uh, field some questions here. And prior to this uh, information that uh, Dan Rose has uh, given us, <coughs> and which he's been a good advocate of uh, ours on this, uh, from, he's uh, a director of the Peace River Regional District, and the time frame started in, they wanted an agreement October, now it's December, they were thinking, and then now early in the new year, we've, uh, We've had some discussions with the ministry, and uh, some of the people went down there. They were, uh, like uh, MLA Bernier says, that they were uh, pushed aside, saying, yeah, we couldn't do this, couldn't do that. We'll let you know. And then now we're into the new year. So what we're doing right now has a little bit of effect on their timeline. So they are kind of listening. So with that, uh, kind of time frame, if any of the council would like to add, uh, you can right now. Go ahead, uh, Laura. Um, I, I guess my next, my question is, what's our next step? How do we get the government to listen to us if they're not gonna listen, if they won't listen to mayor and council, and they won't listen to the people, how, how do we get them to listen if they won't even talk to you? Well, could, I, could I just interject prior to you? Uh, Clay has a little bit more information on uh, timeline, I believe. Clay, can you, like, like when we're pushing the, the time to uh, get that uh, agreement done, uh, do you have any more on that part? And I'll let Laura continue, if not. Uh, no, I think Mike is, um, Okay. Uh, he's wrapped it up. Okay, I'll let Laura continue. Okay, no, go ahead, Laura. That's basically all I just wondering if you had any next steps for us. Well, I think, um, to what Your Worship was saying, uh, I think they're starting to listen. And that would be evident by them canceling meetings. Um, they were going to be sending up some junior staff, possibly an ADM and a few others, to come up and consult with the communities. Uh, I had a meeting scheduled as well. Uh, those were canceled because I believe, and I'm just guessing, but I believe because they were starting to hear all these stakeholders that are not at the table that should be and the pressure that they were going to be getting because of that. For the regional district to do, uh, I would say, the bold move of saying they were going to hold their meeting at the George Dawson Inn in Dawson Creek in a big public arena rather than their uh, board, normal boardroom sent a strong message that it was going to be a large turnout with a lot of the, uh, people who have concerns or at least want to be involved with this discussion. I think that needs to continue. Uh, I've mentioned to other groups, I think there's a couple of different approaches we can do in this with my political advice, is continue as individual municipalities, bringing your voice forward, writing your letters and showing your concern. I think a time will come when we'll want to unite everybody. 
Uh, but right now, I think every group has a different story to tell. And you don't want it to get watered down by the whole region. Let the regional district, who's doing a great job, uh, and Dan and others there representing the region, they're doing a good job with their message. But for Chetwin, you have a different story. You've got the mills. You've got it affected right in your backyard. You have your relationships with West Moberly and Soto that have to be considered. You've got a different issue here than maybe Tumblr Ridge has on what's d down there. So I would, con I would strongly suggest keep putting the, sending the letters forward, CCing me as the local MLA, because I'm compiling everything that I'm getting from all the different stakeholder groups because that's what I'm showing. Look at all these groups that haven't been t uh, spoken with that have a story to tell and need to be listened to. So keep doing that. My feeling again is they're now stalling because they're realizing they better go back and reconsider this. And that's my hope that they're doing that. Um, and if they're pushing it now until January, February, that gives us some opportunity for other groups that haven't been at the table to still have their opinions heard. So it is frustrating, and I, and I share the frustration with people where we're not being heard. Uh, hell, it was hard enough when I was in government, uh, being in Victoria furthest away uh, to be listened to and welcome to politics. It's even tougher now uh, for me down there, which means I have to be louder, bolder, and need more support, to be honest. Uh, so everything you do, I think, uh, will help at the end of the day. Okay, uh, uh, MLA, I'm going to field a question from the audience here. Has, any, has anybody got any questions for uh, MLA Bernier? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of things going on, Your Worship, if I can. Um, yes. There's a couple of things going on. There's a group that's been started up, Concerned Citizens for Caribou Recovery. Uh, they've started an online petition. I believe it's, last time I heard it, somewhere in the 20,000 range. 17, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm meeting with them tomorrow night, so I would've got that there. Um, so I would say keep sharing that. Uh, make sure that people are, are seeing that. And again, it's not just this region, because what I'm hearing is what happens here might be used as a template. Uh, for other parts of the province, or even further up north. You know, if they find an issue up in the Musquecachico, will they do something up there? I mean, I think, again, the biggest concern that I hope people will share is the fact that um, we're stewards of the land. Uh, we're going to be going and using the backcountry for recreational purposes, that we're respectful of the backcountry environment. We're not these crazies that the lower mainland think we are. Uh, just uh, ripping up the back country. We actually respect it and we also respect the wildlife that's back there because we want to coexist. I think that's a strong message that we need to get out there. And so the more, um, the more we share this on social media and the more we get it out there and then the more letters that we can send uh, and I'll start sharing that information on my Facebook pages as well uh, of the different ministers that you can write to uh, because the more we get it out to them, the better. I mean. If I can, there's two ways to approach this. There's the technical, which will be the staff within the ministries. Of course, they'll look at all the information they gather from communities, from stakeholders, and make recommendations up to government. And then there's the political pressure, which is the obvious one that we can actually do as citizens, uh, which is actually getting our voices out there so the government and the ministers actually say, okay, you know, there's a lot of people concerned, and so we need to uh, have a sober second look at this. So every little bit will help. Question? Naomi? Yeah, as a citizen and mayor of uh, Chelman, I would recommend that 
individual, if they could get out there and sign that petition, that would be great. That would show that just Chetland itself would be uh, interested rather than the whole, because there's about 63,000 of us in uh, northeastern BC that uh, care. Well, maybe there's, yeah, I guess about 63,000. But if we can do it as a, as a community, because uh, I stated in, in some of my reports that we are in the eye of the storm. And as uh, MLA Bernier has indicated, Chatwin has everything to lose right now. And we don't want to lose any of that because we are pretty fortunate right now to be in the position that we are moving forward in our economic gains. And if we lose that, we will, we, well, I, just, I, I don't even want to say it. No, I, and I agree, and, and so the chamber is a, is a great voice, and I know other chambers are, are doing the same, so I'm glad to hear that, that, that got passed, thank you. Um, because I don't think a lot of people, and I don't want to sound like I'm fear-mongering in any way, I just want to be a realist on this. There is a huge impact to local business and to communities if this goes through as we think it might be, and I say think because we don't know, um, and that's one of the frustrations. But about 15 minutes before I walked in here, no, actually 45 minutes before I walked in here, I was reading uh, the, my last email uh, that I just received today and it was from a realtor who told me that just yesterday a deal fell through here in Chetwin because the people wanted to put it on hold waiting to see what happens with this plan because they were worried moving to the area from another area. If they bought this house wanting to use the back country and then being told they couldn't, maybe they'll choose a different area. So. That's a real example of how important this is and why we need to have our voices heard and make sure that any decision, I think some, some we have to remember, some decision is going to be made here. Well, I don't think we're going to get away with government saying they're doing, doing nothing. Something is going to happen. I think the whole point is we want to be part of formulating what happens. So at least it's something we can all, uh, in some respectful way, uh, support and say we're, we're doing our part as citizens, but we're also not hindering the growth of our areas, as you said, Your Worship. Clay? Uh, Mike, you talked about uh, when your party was in power there, um, the process that was going on between 2005 and 2014. What was the consultation process like during that time? It all depended on the different, uh, different things that were happening. So for instance, uh, one issue uh, that was taking place up here that a lot of people, you know, there's pros and cons to it, I'll say, is the wolf call. Because a lot of scientific data came in that said uh, a good portion of our uh, caribou uh, and moose and elk uh, were being taken down uh, by, by wolves. And not so much the uh, mature animals, but the, the ungulates and uh, as their breeding was going on, that's when a lot of this was taking place. So that was contentious. So there was a lot of uh, consultation that took place uh, before the calling started, uh, outreach with local First Nations uh, as well, uh, because of course that was uh, something that we knew would be sensitive maybe in some areas. And I won't ask for a poll of hands in this room because I might not be as sensitive as it is in other parts of BC. Uh, but when it came to the consultation on other issues, there wasn't as much when it came to the, um, the industrial side, because of course we're working with forestry companies and mining companies, so the consultation that took place there was with guide outfitters, um, um, trap line association, the groups that were actually maybe affected in those specific areas. Um, but it's, I think this one here, when you look at it, when you're actually just, like I say, drawing a circle on a map and saying it's no-go, the consultation now should be everybody. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just a few stakeholders. This, you know, whether it's ATV clubs, snowmobile clubs, uh, hunters. Um, I mean, if it goes the way the preliminary stuff went out, what they're saying is that you can't put your camper on the back of your pickup truck and drive down a forestry road and go camping on a creek for the weekend with your kids because it's no-go for human activity. Unacceptable. I mean, we live up here for a reason. Every group I've talked to, though, wants that consultation, though, so they can be at the table to say, you know, if it's Snowmobile Association, maybe there are certain times of the year or certain zones uh, when breeding's taking place that they'll stay out of and they can work together, but you don't just say no to the whole region. Right? 
um, at the time then was the partnership agreement with the First Nation communities a mandate um, of the plan? I'm trying to understand the question, Clay, but I think what you're getting to is right now, so there was always the consultation the government had um, with First Nations anytime decisions were being made in this area. And of course, it's a little, I'll be sensitive here, a little different in the peace region because it's treated, whereas other parts of the province are, are not treated, so there's different kinds of uh, consultation that needs to take place. The new government's mandate and the Minister of Environment and Minister of Forest Lands and Natural Resources write in their mandate letter, one of the first things it says is they have to, on all decisions, considerations around UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. So when I've talked with the uh, ministers in the hallway, their first answer on everything is, we're not doing anything until we've got agreement with First Nations, because that's their focus. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, uh, but kind of like I said on the radio last week, good approach, what about everybody else? This is bigger than, than one group, this is, all of us should be involved with this one. And so I get that chat wins a drop in the bucket, like it's not make, gonna make a huge difference in BC's uh, revenue, but if this is a template and can move throughout the entire province, at what point is this gonna start making a difference on our healthcare systems, education mm -hmm. systems, social programs? Um, at, at, at some point, that's gotta start making a, a big dent in it. Sure, well not to argue with you, Councillor, but don't sell yourself short. I think <laughs> that one in the region has a huge impact on the, uh, on the provincial coffers, uh, what we uh, give, uh, what we, um, what we do in this area around the industrial activity, but it's one of the concerns that I have on this is it's not just Chetwin. Of course, today we're here talking about Chetwin, but it's the ripple effect and the message that it'll send about just activity in general. You know, we already see, see this when you have people trying to stop a pipeline going through down south, twinning a pipeline to Vancouver. Uh, the amount of negative global activity that goes on, what people look at British Columbia and say, why would I come there and invest there if I can't even get a project? Well, now figure the fact that we've got projects that are already here, and if they start having to shut down, that's that ripple effect for your West Frasers, your Canfors, uh, your mining companies. I mean, we have some of the best metallurgical coal in the world, and the opportunities here. What message are we sending if we're kind of hindering that activity? So uh, I think it's not just what Chetwin does now, it's what you can even do going forward, there's still so much more potential that we have in the area, and it would be the message, uh, negative message of don't come here, that would scare me. That's all the questions I had for you. I had a few comments, so um, I just wanted to uh, kind of mention that um, our electoral director, E, um, Dan Rose, he's been fighting so hard for us. I mean, if anybody sees him, it's definitely worth buying him a coffee, say thanks, like he has been after it. Like it working really hard for all of us, as everybody has. And um, just because, so there's some speculation that maybe the government has slowed down a little bit from the pressure. We can't back off, we haven't succeeded, we haven't won anything yet. We've gotta keep on it and keep on doing what we've been doing. If, if we think we've made a difference, we've gotta keep, keep forward. And on some news you might hear um, stuff about compensation uh, for the areas. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Mike, but that compensation doesn't go to us. It doesn't go to us for the loss of income, loss of our home values, you know, university educations that can't be paid for anymore. Um, it doesn't, it just goes to the large companies. And those companies will, they'll still be profitable somewhere else, um, probably outside of BC by the sounds of it. but they'll carry on and invest somewhere else and continue to be profitable, take the money out of here, but it doesn't go to us, I don't think, right? No, no I mean, my, my quick answer, understanding it would be no, but there's also, you'll wanna be careful what, uh, until you see the actual writing on any agreement, because when you hear about compensation, there's also other things that government could or might do, and it could be beneficial, to the area, don't get me wrong. But they could turn around and say, okay, well, we're gonna shut down this area, but we're gonna compensate the loss by investing in a different area to allow backcountry use somewhere else. But that money doesn't go to individuals necessarily or to groups. 
what it means is the government just might turn around and say, okay, we're going to put $20 million into a pot and we're going to maybe fix up some forestry roads or replace a few bridges in a certain area where we know there's no um, wildlife so people can access the backcountry in that area. Uh, so I think until you actually see the, you know, the devil in the details kind of thing, it, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, any more questions for uh, MLA Bernier? Yes, you're right. Where's your I'm from Hasler, mm. and uh, I thought that uh, TELUS Communications has an easement against my land to access all across the mountain, where the communication tower is for the microwave system and the uh, BC rail system. And I was just wondering if TELUS has the legal right to block all across the mountain. Yeah. So it's real important to keep the TELUS communication towers open. They, uh, they access it all weather with knowledge. Yes, this would uh, be an issue when, uh, if we're not getting it and the other uh, parts of uh, BC are not getting this, and uh, TELUS uh, being part of uh, supposedly BC. Yeah, so, you know, this is a, a bigger thing than what we want to think or think we are into here when they are not communicating with themselves then there is something i believe that they don't understand themselves so this is a bigger thing than just me and you talking about tell us not coming to you with this caribou thing because the provincial government and the federal government and first nations there's something going on there bigger than what we can tell you right now Mike, you have anything on that, Ms. Bernier? Well, the only thing on that, <laughs> obviously, TELUS is a uh, TELUS is a private company, uh, so of course they don't fall under uh, the discussions, I'd say, initially uh, with with the government. But they would be considered one of those stakeholders, no different than any other company operating in the area, that needs to be at the table because if they shut the backcountry down and then they can't access a tower. You know, we'll end up in that situation, which governments are horrible for, where they make a regulation and then they realize afterwards how horrible it was and start putting more exemptions in than, uh, than they should have had to and then eventually sometimes backpedal. But I mentioned it to the Snowmobile Club last night, and I know there's a few people in the room that are here representing them. Um, we have to remember that once, once this is done, once land is protected, the odds of getting it out is almost impossible. I mean, anybody up here who has agricultural land in the reserves trying to get any land out probably <coughs> shares that frustration. Once a land, like, and we have 40% of the land already in British Columbia is protected by, by some form of regulation. Uh, this will just increase it, and it's so hard to get it out once it's in. So <coughs> we need to do what we can as citizens and as elected officials to get it right the first time. Uh, because if we don't, it, it could have uh, a lot of negative effects. Uh, Mike, you mentioned on, uh, oh, sorry, Ron. No, you, oh. Uh, you, you mentioned about the a home deal that may or may not have fallen through in the last year or two. I think almost every real estate agent in town is in here. Is there somebody that might want to comment to that? Or? Sorry, I missed that. Do you need us to line up in Victoria for you, or what do we got to do? Well, I think, if I can, um, I think what we have to do is what we're doing right now. I mean, it's obviously working, starting to work on getting the message out there that this is a concern. And obviously, when you look at the turnout today, uh, you know, well, I, I guess I should say every council meeting is like this, right? In, in Chatwin. Um, <laughs> I can tell you all my time in mayor, I never had, you know, things like this, except for when we were building a multiplex, but I digress. Um, but I think this is something that we need to continue uh, getting the message out there. When it comes to Victoria, there's a couple of things. We're out of session right now. We go back into session uh, second week of February. So there's pros and cons to that. Um, depends if you, how I answer if you're my wife or not on whether I'm home all the time or not right now. But 
we have a lot of opportunity here to gather information, to have our local meetings like this, to make sure that we're compiling that. When I get back down in February, that's when all of those stories can actually hit the floor in front of the media. Because if there's petitions, I, there's actually times for local uh, MLAs to stand up in the house to talk and to present petitions on issues. So the more we have locally, it gives me more ammunition down there. I think what's going to end up happening, if, if I have the crystal ball on this, if we can keep pushing this to hopefully into February or March before any decision, rash decision is made, it gives us the opportunity of a captive audience because the Premier and all of Cabinet and MLAs are all in Victoria at the same time as myself, which is when by then, I think they will have nothing but a choice to actually start listening to the mayors and councils in the area that they haven't uh, to date. So as long as we can create enough of a, of a uh, delay uh, to get us back to then, when everyone's back, uh, then we schedule the meetings. And I think by then is when the shotgun approach will have to be more consolidated uh, into uh, all the groups, all the mayors, councillors, regional district as one loud, strong voice in Victoria all at the same time. Uh, and that's something I can coordinate where we get everybody down there. If it has to be on the front steps of the legislature, so be it, uh, if they won't meet with us inside, but it might come to that. Ron? Mr. Mayor, uh, I don't know if Mike's aware of this, but I think the template has already been set in the province. And I stand to be corrected because I heard this at the NW. <laughs> it must be true. And you know how reliable <laughs> that is. But anyhow, my understanding is the provincial government is already taking a small section of the west coast of Vancouver Island and done almost the same thing they're talking about here, only not caribou, but they want a, a, a pathway for whales, seals, etc. And what they've done without consultation to any of the sports fishermen or anybody else, they've just gone ahead and done it. So I'm afraid the template has already been set. Now I could be wrong. And then my second, my second uh, thing I want, this is a question to you. <coughs> Provincial elections come up shortly. Mm -hmm. We know how you feel about this situation because of where you live. But my question to you is, what, what are the rest of the provincial liberals, how, what's their feeling towards this thing, and how are they going to take it to the next election? Thank sure. you very much. Sure. Well, thank you, if I, if I may. Good question. So first and foremost, far be it for me to argue with anybody from a and right. <laughs> in Chatwin. Um, in fact, I got a phone call the other day from uh, a group, the a and group, saying, stop advertising all your, all your crap on Facebook. We're not on Facebook. So. So we got to start going there more often. But around the template issue, I guess you could say yes, templates are in place on things like this. If you look at what was done a couple of years ago around the Great Barrier Rainforest, uh, templates, you know, they're all maybe uh, not exclusive, but the idea of putting land protection does and has taken place uh, in the province already. So this wouldn't be by any stretch uh, the first time. Right, if that's what you're alluding to. And on the, on the coast, there is uh, some regulations and some protection uh, that you're talking about as well. I don't know all the details, but I have uh, heard about it. So yes, there are, and continually is uh, discussions around protection or preservation of land base in different areas for different reasons, okay? And if I may interject there, in the interviews I saw, the fishermen, the sports fishermen in particular, had no problem with looking at the same with us. We mm -hmm. feel the same way about, about, about the caribou. They, they feel the same way about the whales, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no consultation. They just went in and did it. And now these fishermen, and it's already happened, now these fishermen, they, they're not, they've got fishing boats, but they can't be hired out for sports fishing. They're, they're literally unemployed. Yeah, and that's obviously something that we want to avoid up here, which is what we have to make sure at the table. And I, and I think most stakeholders and groups are saying, you know, we want to make sure we're doing our part. And if you look at uh, more of a science-based approach, so where are the animals, what times of year, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things we can do. 
And most people are understanding of this. If you look at the Skeena River last year, of course, the sockeye and coho runs were lower than expected. The data, scientific data showed that, so they shut it down to sports fishing. Were they all happy? No, but they understood the reason why, because they want to be able to come back the year or the year after to fish. So everybody tries to do their part. Uh, so again, the template, to your point, there are different styles of templates out there. Now to your other question, um, I could only hope, and this is, I'll try not to be too political, I could only hope that there's a provincial election coming up uh, soon, but right now it's not scheduled till the fall of 2021. So there is no election before that unless something happens, and that's probably for discussion for <laughs> another day. I'm sorry? No, there's a, so the Alberta election is next year as well as the federal election, but the provincial election is uh, not until the fall of 2021. Okay, we'll get our calendar straight, but let's uh, continue with this. Caribou, if anybody yeah. else has got any more questions? Uh, Dale, you got me for... Is the where? Yeah. So I, uh, there's smarter people than me that could answer that one. I am not sure. I know there are some areas uh, that I've heard that have different seasonal closures. Uh, if you, I'm sure if you talk to um, some of the snowmobile clubs, or, you know, they're very uh, much in line and in touch with some of the different backcountry closures. They would probably know better than I on that. Uh, I know there have been some in the past for different reasons. This one's a little different though. This is, they're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of hectares of land uh, just being closed off to human activity. Where they're not talking seasonal, they're not talking temporary, it would be permanent. And so that's why, uh, you know, I think that's why we have to be looking at this one carefully. But other groups would know better than me. Sorry, I can't answer that one. Well, if I can, this, this is actually the, the crux of the issue, right? It's, it's not one person one, or one species of the human race that's actually the issue. I think it could be an accumulation of a whole bunch of different things. The scientific data has shown that. So if you're just going to shut down the backcountry from human activity, but you're not dealing with the bears, the grizzlies, the trains that are, you know, I don't even have to tell you how many animals get killed on the train tracks between here and Prince George all the time, or on the highways. I mean, this is not about just one solution, one easy solution or silver bullet for this. And, and that's what has me worried. That's why, I, again, back to everybody needs to be at the table discussing this, because there's a lot of collective information in this room, people that use the backcountry that know where the animals are, they know what the impacts are, and they can actually share that, which I think will help at the end of the day. So, One more question, Neil. Hi, uh, Alan. Yeah, um, uh, when you say a, a no-go zone for all human activity, do you really mean all human activity, or do you mean um, is there maybe some compensation or some concession for some people? Well, what I'll say right now to that is we don't know. Right now. Um, Right now, the only thing I do know, 100%, is that the ministers have been meeting with uh, local First Nations in Soto and West Moberly. What decisions or agreements have been made there, I'm not, I don't have the knowledge, nor would I be probably privy to tell you that if I did. And that leads me back to the whole point of this, though, again, is the last thing we want is decisions being made without everybody being at the table, right? So there's lots of rumors out there. I'm not going to throw gasoline on the fire because I don't know for sure. Uh, and that's probably the biggest part of my frustration. Yeah, with the, the answer that uh, MLA Bernie has given you is exactly what we get when we ask our neighbors and we don't know what's going to be closed and what the map, where the map is and where all that goes. So until we have that person at the table, 
to negotiate for us, we, we cannot answer your question. We just don't have the answer for you right now. But we're hoping to be with you in January telling you, yes, this is where, what's happening. And hopefully we'll get to that point where we're not shutting down everything like, like what we think. So we can't answer that right now, Neil. Emily? <coughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on Dale's comments there. I was doing some reading this weekend too, and in Bam Banff National Park, which I don't think there's a lot of industrial activity going on or anything there, uh, that herd is pretty much all wiped out uh, naturally. So um, going back to what Mike said too, like things have to be scientific and based on science before you completely cripple an economy. You got to make sure what is going to happen is actually going to work. And if this is what needs to happen, if, if this is what needs to happen to save it, then I guess we can have that discussion. But when you're unsure, when you're going to completely cripple an economy based on a plan that might work, probably not. Um, and, and how much, like, does it have to be this big? Um, can can it go on on half the area that they're talking about? Like we keep on hearing from government that this is science based, but I have a hard time believing that when there's a negotiator drawing the circle on the map. If it was science based, you'd think there'd be a wildlife expert drawing the lines on the map. But that's yeah. just my thoughts. Yeah. No, and I and I totally agree. And that's I, I think at the end of the day, that's what we're asking for. If it's if they do have the information, then share it and say we want to close down this area, and here's the science to back it up. I don't think they can do that because I don't think they've got that level of detail. I think they have some knowledge of how many caribou are out there. Uh, they know how many are in decline. But without looking at it again holistically, it's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction. And I'm sorry if I offend anybody in the room when I make this comment, but it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction when you shut down grizzly bear hunting in the entire province and say no hunting grizzlies. I've heard from numerous people in this area, whether it's trappers, guide outfitters, or sportsmen, who say, do, you, do they have any idea how many grizzlies, first of all, we have up here? And the tags were let out on a science-based approach that was a sustainable approach for harvesting. But now without that, and with them being allowed to grow uh, their herds, what's that impact gonna have on other parts of the food chain uh, as we go down? So. It, it could affect not just caribou. You know, with the amount of wolves and the predation that we have in the area and grizzlies, I mean, it's other species as well. And so again, this is not just drawing a circle on a map and all will be good kumbaya moments. It's not going to happen. Right. Councilor Laura, go ahead. Yep. Um, Mike, I know when we f this all first started, we were told that there was a deadline for the, that um, the federal government wanted the provincial government to have contracts signed with the First Nations by the end of November. Well, that's come and gone. Um, do you know any more about that? Because you said you don't go back into session to the second week of February, which is a long time from now, and a lot can happen within a month and a half. Like, do you know of any more timelines and you if don't? and when they're going to sign agreements? Sure. Well. My hope is one isn't already signed already. Is it still within Yeah, so, so there's two things here, again, uh, to the gentleman's point. So the federal government is saying to the provincial governments that you have to have a policy in place to protect your species at risk and in caribou. But if you look right across the border in Alberta, Alberta just pushed back and said, you know what? We're starting to talk to our stakeholders. This is bigger than we thought. And they pushed back to the federal government and said, we need more time, we need more money, we need more research, we need more data before we can come up with a, a plan. Don't download it completely on the province. Our provincial government here has not pushed back yet to the, to the federal government. I'm hoping with what we're doing, it might send a message to them to piggyback with what Alberta is, uh, is doing. Um, but the only thing I can say around the timelines is, and I probably got the same emails as you, but last week when they canceled the meeting with me again, the email they gave me said, they're taking a new look at all this and they will get back and try to reschedule a meeting with me at the end of January. And that was the extent of the email I got. So that gave me actually a little bit of hope because they better not be coming out and announcing something before they've actually met with people. So at least that's six weeks away. Right? Yep. There's two 
So this is where, where I can come in uh, as the local MLA, and I'll, I'll be blunt and say it's been hard because the last two months has been consumed around this referendum around proportional representation. Uh, I won't even get into that one today because that's that ship sailed, uh, the deadline's over, we're waiting for the results. Uh, but media was consumed by that and consumed by some other crazy stuff that was happening in the legislature the last uh, couple of weeks. One advantage of being out of session and going into the Christmas season is the media is craving for inf information because there's not as much out there. You know, uh, If they're having to talk about in Vancouver somebody's dog went missing and somebody found it and that's the top story, obviously they're looking for news. So uh, we have an opportunity. I, I know the people at Global and I've been giving them this information as well and it hasn't percolated uh, into the, the news cycle yet. Uh, but I think if we can keep this kind of activity going, uh, it'll be important that we do that. Uh, and the gentleman over here, when he was saying, um, although it's not an election, but the rest of the Liberal caucus, it's uh, this, yeah, there could be an election. We'll get into that. I'll come by the a and we'll have a talk on this. Uh, it's a good talk, you'll I mean, need a couple hours for sure, because uh, it's crazy right now, that's a different story. But the, uh, from the BC Liberal caucus, we have the Rural caucus, and this is the number one issue that we've put forward on the agenda, so we've had our own meetings. We actually have just put a paper together uh, last week. We just circulated it today with, internally with the MLAs and the BC Liberal side to share with the media to try to get some traction on this. Uh, because aside from three or four, almost every single rural MLA is in the BC Liberal caucus. So it's something that we talk about all the time. And so my hope is, is that we can get it into the media but to what you were saying, here's the uphill battle, and I think we all know this. You look at the other stories that are coming out there on this issue. Um, UBC yesterday, one of their um, um, professors came out with a paper saying that, sorry, rural BC, you're going to have to feel the pain. And I think that was the quote unquote what they said, because they said, you know, we've lived for so long with the industrial activity in rural BC at the detriment of Mother Nature, and it's time to let Mother Nature come back. That's what we're faced with. I think most people know that's what we're faced with with people down south, uh, and that's the way they, some of them, think. They don't, they've never been here, they don't understand. They think that we're doing things we're not. Uh, you know, they hear about fracking or mining, and they just figure it's the rape and pillage of the land. Um, so that's also what we're up against, not just the politics of it. I was just wondering, I, I've seen really, really old pictures that Vancouver and Victoria used to be pristine rainforest too, or are we going to go back to that? <laughs> Some of the best uh, caribou and uh, moose hunting territory was actually in the Squamish uh, nations, which is now Vancouver. So. We had one over here. Just, uh, just a comment, maybe we should shut your commissioner's office. <laughs> um, yeah, and their gas, we almost did that. Thing. Wow, see that's another one that it depends on what kind of regulations they put in. So, I'm just an example I can use, agricultural land, I'll use that one again. You know, they put the protection in and you're in the agricultural land uh, reserve and then they'll put policies or regulations in place of the do's and don'ts within that reserve. So my guess is that they'll do something similar here. Uh, so back to the point of why we have to make sure that we're feeding as much information as possible because when those regulations come in and they protect, we want them to shrink down to the point where they're protecting the area that's actually the crucial area that needs to be protected and we can probably agree with that and what kind of protection, whether it's seasonal or what have you. Um, and then 
again, the devil's in the details as far as the regulations that would be accompanying any legislation on land protection they'd put in, and don't know until they do that. Right? Okay, uh, with that, then, what, what we, uh, as uh, members of Chetwin Citizens, uh, when we go into negotiations, when they're going to ask us to go into negotiations, uh, split uh, between uh, uh, community and outlying areas and snowmobile clubs and uh, maybe, say, the uh, cross-country ski team, whatever. Everybody has to be together. There's no splitting fractions here, and everybody has to be on the same page and who is going to negotiate. So when we do get to that point, which uh, MLA Bernie and myself and council hope that we, were, we will be on that uh, uh, negotiating team here in January, February, after the uh, re, uh, recess is over. But as for that, uh, we will uh, close uh, with that discussion. It's been a good discussion. Uh, we will field one more question. Is this for uh, MLA Bernier? No, this is just for a statement. Uh, regarding recreational uses of snowmobiles. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be gathering on the Trail Park Center. We asked the room to discuss what key areas we want to keep. Yeah. What time? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Mike, thank you very much for uh, coming to, well, whatever insight we got. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to thank the audience for uh, attending. This was great and uh, show of support that uh, council needs and uh, we all appreciate it very much. Uh, with that, I'd like to call the uh, meeting adjourned. Make a motion. Okay, all in favor, carry. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody.